awake and maybe excited. Kaya prayed. And uh, all four, there's going to be four of us speaking. Sidney's going to start us off, and Adam's going to follow him, then Tom, and then I will finish it up. And each one of us are going to go exactly 15 minutes. Okay. Now, th this is four preachers. Okay. And we're going exactly 15 minutes because we got to eat at noon because the ladies are anticipating us. So here we are. We're about to start. This is the. <laughs> oh. So here we go, Brother Sidney. No pressure, right? At this first uh, particular session, of uh, first round of this session, we're supposed to talk about when Jesus prayed. We have, I think, established throughout our studies just thus far the importance of prayer life in the child of God. I mean, it is vital to our faithfulness as a child of God. And when we want to think about prayer, we want to study prayer, what better way than to look at individuals who prayed? Individuals who prayed with results, if you please. Uh, it's already been pointed out that uh, oftentimes men prayed when they were not praying uh, to the right person, to the right being. Uh, James said uh, some didn't receive because they didn't ask. Others didn't receive because they asked amiss. But what we're interested in is, is getting it right, if you please. And so by looking at the, the prayers of, of various ones, how, how better way to learn, what better way to learn than looking at the prayers of great men, Paul, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, whatever. There's so many of them, and, and he's chosen four in this particular setting. And so when we began to look at the idea of when Jesus prayed, first thing I want us to think about is how he prayed. How did he pray? And that'll help us formulate within our lives something that maybe will help, help us in that regard. First thing I would mention, and Tom just uh, dealt with this pretty extensively a moment ago, from James chapter 5 and verse 16, when he talked about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, when you take your Bible and you turn back to Luke 22, just, just one of the accounts of this, but you'll notice something in the life of our Lord. He is coming near the end of his life. Uh, the betrayal is about to take place. He goes out into the garden, and in uh, verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, there are other passages that we could have used in that regard. But you remember that on that occasion, he prayed three times, same thing. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but as thou wilt. He, wa he wanted to do the will of the Father. So not only did he pray earnestly concerning his situation, the fact that he was about to die, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But at the same time, he prayed just as earnestly that the Father's will be done. And that's where we need to be today. That is praying fervently that, that God's will will be done in our lives and in the lives of others as well. So when we look at the how, we understand very clearly that he prayed earnestly. But we also notice that he prayed alone. Now we've noted uh, three or four sections of Scripture here, and we could have noted uh, many others in this regard. But again, in the book of Luke, and it's amazing how much of Jesus' prayer life Luke actually records, more so than, than the others in that regard. But in uh, Luke chapter 5, and in verse 16, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And you'll find that sentiment in, in several different places. We've, we've noted others there in uh, chapter 6. And in verse 12, you have a, a similar phrase found. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. 
So he went out alone is the implication in that regard. Uh, in chapter 9, verse 18, you have similar language there. But you'll remember in Matthew chapter 6, again, this is the instruction that Jesus was giving his disciples relative to prayer. And he said, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which seeth in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So here's the idea of, of being alone in prayer. That's, that's the way he prayed in that regard. But it affects us in the same way. When we are alone, when it's just us and God, if you please, does it change the way we pray? As opposed to when we have others who are hearing us. How does our language compare when we're praying to God alone and when we're praying to God with others present? Now there are times that we have to pray with others present. If we're praying as we uh, should be doing at our meal times at home, when we are praying in a public assembly as, as we have done here, uh, will do today, uh, things like that, we, we understand there are times when we have to pray in the presence of others, when we need to pray in the presence of others. But there are times when we need to get in that closet. There are times that when we need to sense the fact that it is just us and God in that regard. And it's my conviction that our, our prayers and the language of our prayers, the nature of our prayers, knowing that it's just God and us, will change considerably. And we're not going to go through these, but to simply emphasize that our Lord prayed often. He prayed often. And, and you can see just from chapter 5, and all, this is all in Luke. Chapter 5, verse 6. Chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 9, verses 18 and 28. Chapter 11 and verses 1 and following. Chapter 22. And there's a misprint on that. That should be not verses 31 through 31. That wouldn't cover a lot of territory. But, but in that particular section of Scripture, here He is praying. And you see that over and over and over and over. I've often thought about Paul in that regard. I don't think anybody's going to talk about Paul. But, but Paul in that regard, how often he would say as he would begin some of his letters, how he prayed for those brethren, who he prayed for. It, it seems to me that there was a great deal of Paul's time and life spent in prayer or else he could not have covered all of the territory that he talked about in his prayer life. And so when we think about that, how often do we pray? Uh, it's already been mentioned, how often are we tempted? And I like uh, the illustration that, that Tom mentioned uh, a while ago with the idea that who knows us better than God and Satan? I mean, I, I've often used the illustration that that you could fill this pulpit area up here and stack it to the ceiling with ice cold beer and I could walk off and never look back. That's not a problem for me. But it might be your problem. You might have a problem walking away from it. But I don't know what your weakness is and you don't know what mine is and I'm not going to tell you. But I tell you one thing, the devil knows what it is and it may be more than one thing. But he knows us well and we are tempted on a regular basis so how often should we be praying? As a matter of fact, when, uh, when Jesus in this instruction said one of the things for which we should pray, lead us not into temptation. How often do we need to pray that prayer? On a very regular basis. So when we look at Christ in that regard, we see that He prayed often. We also noted from uh, Luke chapter 6 and in verse 12 that there were times when He prayed long. In that particular section, he continued all night in prayer to God. How long, what is, what is the longest that you've ever prayed? That's probably a foolish, stupid question. But what is the longest that you've ever prayed? My guess is, if you could recall that occasion, there was something pretty traumatic happening in your life. And you spent a lot of time in prayer to God. We, we sometimes say, I don't know where to turn. Why not turn to God? 
They're crucial situations that we face in life. And he prayed long and often and alone and fervently. And if we could just incorporate those four basic points in our prayer life, would it not make a difference in our prayer life? I believe it would. But then, looking briefly at for what or for whom did he pray? And again, we could not uh, begin to exhaust this in our study at this point. But he, you'll notice at the very outset, for what? That the Father's will be done. What greater thing? For what greater thing? Could we pray than the Father's will be done? We, we saw this in the garden, and there are three verses there, Matthew's account of that particular occasion uh, for which he prayed. Then he prayed for others. And we have numerous examples in, uh, in Luke chapter 22. That's one of the occasions that we mentioned to you a moment ago. But in verses uh, 31 and 32 of that section, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. So here was an occasion where the Lord knew something about Peter that maybe Peter wasn't even aware of. But he prayed for Peter in that regard. In John chapter 17, and if you want to talk about an actual prayer of the Lord rather than the instructional prayer of Matthew chapter 6, here's a good example of that. He begins, first of all, by praying for himself in John 17. And then after he deals with that, you come down to verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And he goes on to, to pray further about those disciples in that particular context. Then you'll recall in uh, uh, Luke uh, chapter 23, and so we go back to the book that records so much about his prayer life. Then said Jesus, Luke 23 and verse 34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. He prayed for his enemies, didn't he? In the closing part of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us how to deal with our enemies. And maybe you don't have enemies. I think I've got one. But we, we have those people who come into our lives that don't like us so well. So how do we react? What do we do? As Tom said a moment ago with regard to his personal situation, what do you do? What about God? Bring God into the picture. Pray to God. That's what we have in this particular uh, section. Then in John chapter 17, going back to that uh, uh, section of, of unity for which he was praying, he prayed for and not only the disciples, but he prayed for the believers. In essence, in that context, he prayed for you and me. Because we are believers of that word that they were going to preach in that regard. And, so the, and we could include others in that particular section. But then in John 17 as well, he prays for unity. As he is including these apostles, these disciples, in his prayer life, he says concerning others, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So we can see in this regard, how did he pray? Fervently, alone, often, long. For what or whom did he pray? He prayed for others. He prayed for the Father's will. He prayed for unity. So when we think about it in that regard, how does our prayer life compare to just those few points with regard to the prayer of our Lord? How can I improve my prayer life in view of these few things that we have made in that regard? I've just started a timer. <laughs>
Make sure I'm on task. Elijah. One of the most interesting and intriguing characters in all of Scripture. And hold on to your seats. We're going to kind of fly through his life and make a few applications uh, at, at the conclusion. Uh, we read about Elijah starting in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. Up to this point in Israel's history, we've, we've seen and we've witnessed Saul and his, his, uh, the ups and downs of his kingship. And we've seen David and his ups and downs. We've seen Solomon and his great wisdom, but also Saul's mistakes that he made. And by the time that we arrive in 1 Kings 17, Israel is on a downward slide. And uh, the nation uh, is filled with idolatry. And they, they're being led by leaders who are leading them in every direction but towards God. Right now, Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom, uh, and uh, they are worshiping the god of Baal. He's the god of rain. He's the god of harvest, uh, they believe. And so spiritually, Israel is in crisis right now. Uh, so who does God send to this, to, uh, to Ahab, to this nation? None other than Elijah. Through Elijah, God sends a drought that would last for three years. Keep in mind that their God was the God of rain and harvest. Yet, uh, he, through Elijah, God showed that he was the God of nature uh, by sending the drought. But it was also through, Elijah prayer, through Elijah's prayer and through God uh, that rain is sent upon the land that ends the drought. Elijah is fiery, but he is a faithful man of God. He's not afraid to assess the situation and determine what needs to be done or said. By speaking the truth, Elijah becomes an enemy of Ahab and his wife Jezebel, an enemy of the state. And we often see him on the run, uh, continually on the run in in these few chapters that he's in. He's often living in caves or being uh, miraculously sustained by God's hand. Speaking of that, there's a time where he's once sustained by ravens who brought him bread and meat every day. He's once sustained by a widow and her son who really, she only believed she had enough uh, flour just to get, to, to get by just one other meal, and yet God works in that situation. He's also sustained once in a cave by an angel who brought him food in his time of need. And it's Elijah that we've already heard today who challenged Baal, challenged those 450 prophets of Baal in 1 first, first Kings 18, and he, he asked them and gave them the first shot to call upon their God, and then he took his turn, and, and as was mentioned, just once, just one call, and God acted in that moment. And it was Elijah who, after choosing his successor, Elisha, Elijah is taken to heaven in a whirlwind in 2 Kings 2. His ministry is, is brief. The things we learn about him are amazing. Um, and yet, as brief as his life is, uh, his life is full of intrigue and, and interest for me and example. And I would say that of Elijah, his life is nothing like mine in the things that he did. And it's a life I would have liked to have witnessed personally. Yet, as I turn into my New Testament, as a verse we've looked at today in James chapter 5, this is what's said about Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he, he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I'll be honest, Elijah is a man that I wouldn't think would be like me, but James, an inspired writer, says he is a man just like you and me, with a nature like ours. So my first question is, how is Elijah like us? Or how are we like Elijah? And these are just some ideas. But first, Elijah was a man who came from nowhere. Uh, In 1 Kings 17.1, it's the first we ever read about Elijah, and it just says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel is, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. He just appears on the scene, on the pages of Scripture from nowhere, from the land of, or from the region or city of Tishbe, or Tishba, however you would like to pronounce that. And I did a little bit of digging. I tried it. I couldn't really uncover much information about where he came from. Uh, Victor, some of you guys have studied longer. Maybe you know more about that. But I could find really nothing of importance about where Elijah came from. He was from nowhere. And so I thought, well, how does that compare to us? Well, we live in rural West Tennessee, right? Or at least I do. I know some of y'all are from Florida. And I'm not trying to put down Paris. It's a great place. But this is a small place. I'm not famous. A few of you may be famous in, in good or bad ways. I don't know, but I'm not. Uh, I, in, in the grand scheme of the world, there's not a lot of importance by just me as an individual in the world's eyes. But like God used Elijah to bring about some spiritual revival, 
God can use each one of us, and, and within our sphere of influence, maybe you're called to just make that difference in your family or in your church or at your workplace, whatever it may be. God can use you. So we may come from nowhere like Elijah, but God can use us. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who God is, and that's the God we serve. And so that's one way, at least, that we're like Elijah. But Elijah also dealt with discouragement. Elijah's life is really, or at least his ministry, excuse me, is really only in about six chapters of the Bible. You could go home today and read it in 20 minutes and know everything about Elijah that you could know from Scripture. And yet, Elijah, as faithful as he was, and we see him in some spiritual highs. I mean, imagine being Elijah and just showing uh, who God is on Mount Carmel with all those prophets of Baal. And Elijah said, I'm the, I, I alone am left, he said. And he showed who the real God is. But do you know what happens in the very next chapter? Elijah is on the run again. And he actually prays to God that he would die in the very next chapter. And so following that spiritual high on a mountaintop, literally and, and spiritually, he goes into one of his lowest points because he's continually facing discouragement. He's outnumbered. And so don't we deal with discouragement? We just get discouraged. I, I get discouraged over so many things. Um, and some of it is just, you, you can uh, see what's going on in our nation, see what's going on in our communities, that's discouraging. Sometimes we see what's going on in our churches, and that's discouraging. Uh, and maybe we get discouraged because things aren't going our way, or because life events are going on that are kind of beating us down and really challenging us. But we face discouragement from time to time. Uh, but Elijah was just like us, with a nature like ours. He dealt also with the ups and downs of life, but was able uh, to remain faithful. What's another way that Elijah was like us? Well, Elijah lived in an age of idolatry, as was mentioned earlier. The, the nation struggled with worship, worship of God, but worship of Baal, uh, that, that idol of theirs. And so uh, idolatry was rampant, it was everywhere, but we too live in an age of idolatry. Again, we don't have the, 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 the altar set up in our towns like they did, but we have idolatry. And as was mentioned before, it can be anything that comes between you and God. We live in an age where people call evil good and good evil, Isaiah 5.20. And Elijah, he called Israel to, to choose a God to serve. If you're going to serve Baal, then serve him. But if you're going to serve God, serve God. Don't waver between these two different opinions any longer, uh, 1 Kings 18.21. And we have the same decision to make today, don't we? Who is it that we're really going to serve? How are we going to, uh, to use our time and use our talents? What are we going to do? And, and men, God has called us to be the leaders of our homes. And so what are we going to do as we lead? Another way Elijah was like us is that his country was experiencing a drought, both physically and spiritually. And as I mentioned earlier, we're living in that spiritual drought right now, I believe. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom or negative, but, uh, but I just think that our, our nation is as, as least spiritual as it's ever been. And so, uh, but following that, Elijah was like us because his country needed to be refreshed and revived. And I believe ours does as well. And one of the ways that God did that was through Elijah. We need a spiritual refreshment. And could it be, perhaps, that prayer is something that we're missing, something that we need to be leaning on to bring about that revival? I believe it begins in Christian homes, the revival of a nation. I believe that with all of my heart, and God has called us to lead those homes. What are some lessons from men, from men today from Elijah's life, from his prayer life? We've looked at maybe how Elijah is like us, and I'm at about right about nine minutes, so we're hanging in there. Lessons for men today, for me today, pray often. This was mentioned just a moment ago. Over and over again, Elijah turned to prayer. It wasn't a last resort. It wasn't number two or number three on the list. He didn't go to prayer after he had talked to everyone else and gotten everyone else's opinion. Elijah went to prayer. It was his first line of defense. And how often when we're discouraged or having a bad day or we're not sure what path to take or what decision to make, how often do we pray after we've exhausted every other option? What if, how, how might things be different if we prayed first? Find that time. Maybe it's on the way to work or on the way home, in the morning, in the evening. Maybe it's at the dinner table. Whatever it may be, let, uh, let, pray often and let you and your family pray together. Let your children see you pray. So pray often and pray with conviction and expectation. And what I love about this point is that Elijah, you know, you, you recall that scene on Mount Carmel. He gave the prophets of Baal an opportunity, right? 
And when it came time for him, he, he remade, rebuilt the altar, and he had them put water on it. And he said, do it again. So they put more water on it. And then, he, even still, he knew God would come through. And, of course, the, the lightning, the flame came down and, and consumed it all. And so Elijah did all that, and he still, he, he knew. He prayed in that moment with that expectation that his God would come through. And to me, this is the hardest part of prayer. Um, obviously, we need to pray in accordance with God's will, but we don't always know what the outcome is going to be. We don't always know how exactly God is going to answer that prayer or when he will answer that prayer. But I know that we're, pray to, to pray, we're called to pray with conviction and expectations, like James mentioned in James 1, 6 through 8. And we need to pray often, pray with conviction, and pray with passion. When's the last time we poured our hearts out to God? You know, we're passionate about many things. I love football. I love the Tennessee Titans. I like to follow them in the fall. And we have different, uh, many here are UT Vol fans. I'm not, well, for whatever it's worth. But um, we've got, we, love our, we love our sports. And maybe uh, we have different passions in life. But are we passionate about prayer? Are we passionate about uh, our relationship and cultivating that relationship with God? We also need to pray with faith. When you read through Elijah's life, and this is a, an interesting point for me, is that his prayers, at least the ones that are recorded for us, and I know that Elijah prayed more, but his prayers are not very long. Uh, when when uh, Elijah's prayers for the drought, but also for the rain three, months, three years and six months later, those prayers aren't specifically recorded for us. Uh, once Elijah prayed that a widow's boy may be ra- might be raised, and he was, that prayer was only 37 words when you take those two different small prayers there in that passage in chapter 17. When he prayed on Mount Carmel, it was only 61 words. When he prayed, at, when he prayed to God that his life might be taken away from him uh, in chapter 19, verse 4, that prayer is only 17 words long. And I'm just going by, uh, by English, and it might differ a little bit by your translation. Uh, the point is, though, that they're not long prayers. And honestly, just from a human perspective, they're not particularly eloquent prayers. But they're faithful prayers. And they're passionate and they're meaningful and they're fervent. And they, he was convicted that what he was asking God was able and willing to do. My concluding thoughts as I think about Elijah, I'm going to check my time here. Uh, my concluding thoughts are this, and it's just two things. Don't underestimate the power of prayer. It's often the last thing that we turn to or think about doing. Why is that? And I think sometimes we want immediate results. And when we don't get them, we're discouraged. Uh, But hang in there. Have faith. Know that God is going to answer your prayer. So don't underestimate that power. And number two, and this is as plain as it gets, be a man of prayer. Lead your family. Pray every day. Pray with your children. Talk to your kids about the struggles you have with prayer or in the Christian life. Pray for your children. Pray with your children. Pray with your wives. Pray for your wives. Pray for your church. Pray for your country. Pray for your workplace. Pray for an opportunity to share the gospel. Uh, Share with God your, your highest of highs. Share with God your lowest of lows. But pray. Pray, pray, pray. And it's only uh, when we pray that God can work through us to bring about a spiritual revival in our homes, uh, in our cities, in our states, and maybe even our world. Since time is a valuable commodity, I was simply noted as this when I was originally planning this little portion of the lesson, what I ended up with was two lessons that ended up nearly 80 minutes long. So I'll try to conduct this in such a fashion as, or to reduce it to where it will not last but just these few moments. You know, normally when you start talking about uh, characters from the Bible that are considered in context of prayer, what, who usually comes to mind first? You know, you think about the concept of patience. Job first comes to mind. When you start talking about prayer from a biblical standpoint, biblical character, who comes to your mind first? Usually Daniel. Does not? I mean, you've got somebody that is normally praised or is known to have prayed three times a day. But one thing about the situation where Daniel is concerned, we don't know much about the content as far as his prayers. We know about the frequency in which he was engaged, but we don't know much about the content. And very seldom, if ever, is Moses ever put in the context of prayer and being a man of it. 
We learn about him a little bit in Exodus 12th chapter. He's noted as a man, and I believe it's about verse 13, is one of the meekest of the earth. That is an interesting characteristic. Uh, we have a tendency upon the occasion to think of meekness in terms of weakness, and that is not the case at all. When you take the word that's found meek in the scripture and, and interpret that from the Hebrew language, it is usually put in context and translation as well with a word uh, such as humility. And when you define humility, even from the Greek language, you're going to find it primarily referring to a sense of modesty. In other words, as well, it is also defined in terms of one thinking about one's own smallness. And so when I begin to think about Moses from that perspective and when he prayed, there is the recognition of his own smallness. Now that in spite of the background in which he lived, his, his background and his upbringing was somewhat, uh, I suppose you might say, rather uh, significant from the standpoint that when he was born, of course born as a Hebrew child, the edict had come out from the Pharaoh to destroy those that were Hebrew children. His parents, of course, were very concerned about that. And then, of course, the production of the, the small reed boat that was placed in the Nile and found of one of Pharaoh's daughters, most likely the Pharaoh at that time would probably have been his granddaughter. I am of the opinion that the Pharaoh at this time was probably either Tutmosis the first or second, and likely the woman that found him was Hatshepsut. I have looked at the face of this woman, and any of you may have had the opportunity to do it as well. She was an ugly thing. But nevertheless, this is likely the face of the woman that might have held Moses herself. And uh, having grown up in this situation, knowing that uh, because he was likely wrapped in a Hebrew cloth, his sister had been watching these events as they were transpiring. She, the, the, the princess is wanting to know if there's some way that she might be able to find a nurse for this child. Miriam provides the information, and therefore, as uh, God's providence is going to have it, Moses' mother is brought into the palace, and she's going to be the one to nurse and rear Moses. Now, that plays a little bit of a role in all of this, because when you go back to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we learn a little bit about Moses here, we are told that by faith, verse 27, that he forsook Egypt. Back up in verses 24 and 25, it is also by faith that he was one that chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. How is it that he's come to this conclusion? His mother has taught him and given him a background as far as who God was and, and the way and direction that he should go. That, I think, plays a bit of a role in the elements that are eventually going to transpire in his connection between the people of God and God himself. One of the occasions, and I was mentioning Daniel a moment ago, we don't know much about the content of his prayer at all, but we do know a little bit about the content of Moses. And some of his prayers are rather interesting. You turn your Bibles with me, if you would, for a moment to the 10th chapter of the book of Exodus. And Exodus chapter 10 is an interesting account here because now it is the case that the people of Israel, the cries of the people have been heard by God. God is responding. Moses has been sent. He's told to Pharaoh to turn the people loose. The Pharaoh is not relenting. The plagues are now coming. The, here in Exodus chapter 10, the plague of hail and fire has just occurred. There is very little vegetation that is left. Now that is a cause of tremendous concern to an empire that depends a great deal upon what is produced from the valley of the Nile. People's lives are at stake here. The economy is at stake. Therefore, the security of Egypt is at stake. The nobles and some of the advisors are coming to Pharaoh and telling him, I tell you what you need to do, O king. You might need to be listening to and taking some common sense approach to the things that are taking place in connection with Moses and the people of Israel. Moses is brought in. The plea again is made. Pharaoh is relenting to a point to suggest as well, I'll tell you what I'll do, I will, let, I will let the men go out into the wilderness and you can worship and then come back. So Moses had told him that if you don't turn them loose, the plagues that are, have come are not near as bad as what's coming. God's going to send locusts on the land. Well, that's not evidently very impressive, but nevertheless, he, on, he only makes that concession. And when that's the case, it essentially is no concession at all. And so from this point, 
then God sends the locust, and what vegetation is left is now destroyed, and now. Now these people are getting to be somewhat tenuous about what their survival is going to be. Now they're coming to Pharaoh again and putting the pressure on him. So he hastily calls for Moses. And then he makes these statements. If you're seeing about verse 10 and, and the following, go through the section. <laughs> and what he does to me is humorous. Ridiculous, but humorous. He calls for Moses. He tells him, first of all, I've sinned against God and against you. Now pray for me. But here's the stipulations I'm going to put on the prayer. You pray for this sin, this plague, just once. This is all you do. You just make this petition, this entreaty, one time, and only clarify and clean the matter of this death and this destruction. That's the only thing that you can ask for. Now, verses 18 and 19 tells us that's, that's what Moses does. He prays for the people, and the locusts are removed. Now, here, this is just one account of Moses' prayer. Here you got a sense of, the, of uh, some of the content of what he's praying for in this account. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 32. In Exodus chapter 32, the people of Israel are at Sinai. Moses is on the mount receiving the law of God. Now, he's been, over there, been up there a little over a month. The people do understand that Moses is the one that's been selected by God to lead them. They understand that Moses has this connection with God. Now, he's not there. Their perceptions at this particular point is that, well, now, he's not here. He must have left. And if his connection, of course, is with God, then that means likely God's gone with him. So we have no leader, no God. So the first thing they do then is they begin to surmise in their mind, well, we've got to have one or both. So they come to Aaron first to tell you what you do. They know he's evidently a metalsmith. You need to provide us something like what we had down in Egypt. Now, he's not wanting to, but he finally is talked into it and provides for them a golden calf. Now, some of us were talking about this a few moments ago. This in this scene provides one of the two of the most stupid things that human beings have ever uttered. One of which, of course, was in John chapter 8 when the people of Israel said that we, being Abraham's seed, never been in bondage to any man when they were in bondage at the time. And now you're seeing a situation that after Aaron has produced this calf, they then will make this assertion, Behold the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. How stupid. And now, when Moses is upon the mountain, God is telling him, I think it's about time that you get back down because the people have corrupted themselves. And so he gets back down, finds them worshiping and carrying around this immoral activity around the golden calf. He becomes so enraged, he breaks the tablets of stone, which God had written the law, takes the golden calf, grinds it up in powder, puts it in the water, makes the people drink. Then he tells the people, I'm going to return back to the mount, and I'm going to take this opportunity to make atonement for your sin. You're going to see in verse 30. But then I want you to look with me. If you're looking at Exodus 32, read with me verses 32, well, 31 and 32. And Moses returned, and the Lord said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and made them gods of gold. Now watch this. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, the original language leaves it somewhat of an indication that there may be a pause here. If thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot, I pray thee, out of Thy book, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Of course, God's going to go and tell him, says, no, only those that have sinned against me will I blot out. That's sincere prayer, isn't it? How many of you have prayed that your life or your soul be taken instead of someone else? And you want to know the sincerity and the depth of sincerity of man like Moses having offered prayer? 
You turn over to chapter 34 of Exodus and you look at verses 8 and 9. Here's another occasion you have to go through the background. Of course, it's just following up from here. Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth in worship, and he said, Now if I found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us for us a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. Why is it that some of those statements like this is made? Do you remember that God had become so enraged with what he had seen, with what was going on at the foot of the mount, that he was this? close to dispatching them and you remember he told Moses I'll get rid of them and I'll make of you a new nation you talk about the power of prayer the prayer that Moses offered on that occasion was a prayer that changed the mind of God and this is something that Moses later is going to tell the people in the book of Deuteronomy he said I besought for you a number of times and one of those occasions was the salvation of you people. He said, the times that I have known, was it Deuteronomy 9? I have known you from the time of the beginning, and you've been a stiff-necked and a rebellious people. And I prayed really for your own regard and safety, your salvation. And now I think about a prayer that he offered on his own behalf. It's a little bit like Paul's. You remember how Paul was at 2 Corinthians 12, where he had besought the Lord three times about his thorn in the flesh, and God tells him, my grace be sufficient to In Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think it is, if you'll note, back over about 25, verse 26, here is where Moses besought the Lord regarding himself. Let me go in the land and see it. And then God's going to tell him, no, this is what he's reporting. Moses is telling this to the people. God told me no. And in fact, he went on to say, and don't speak to me anymore in this matter. You know, sometimes there is an occasion when our speaking to the Lord and our petitions that are made to him, he has answers to our petitions, doesn't he? Yes, no, maybe, or later. And this is one of those occasions just like Paul. Paul says, I besought regard my thorn in the flesh three different times. And God says, my grace be sufficient. That's another way of saying, no, this infirmity that you have is something that's going to remind you. This situation where Moses is concerned not only is reminiscent to him regarding the act that he had taken in sinning when he strikes the rock when he's supposed to speak to it, but it serves as an example to the people whom he had led, many of which could, or many of whom could not go into the land because of their sin. God's just, isn't he? So here you're seeing a number of examples of what we can understand from the power of prayer, even from one of whom we normally don't associate with prayer from the Bible. Moses was a remarkable man. Imagine the things that had gone through his mind and would go through his mind, even throughout the occasions when he would have been in the area of paradise, because I think about the occasion when the Lord appeared in John the 17th chapter, and he, Elijah, got together with the Lord on that scene. And remember, they were talking about things having to do with the kingdom. I've often wondered what all that conversation was about, but that conversation was marvelous. Keep in mind Moses. Learn from him. Understand that there are difficulties that we face, the powers in prayer, but make sure that we're right with God, and that'll make the difference in our prayer. Turn your Bibles to Second Kings, the twentieth chapter. Second Kings, the twentieth chapter. Before we get into that text there, I want to make some uh, introductory marks. Uh, the first mark I want to make involves names in the Bible. Folks, when names were used in the Bible, they were used quite differently than the way we use names. They were used as identification tags, but they were more than identification tags. There were at least two other purposes for names. Number one, they described the makeup or the character of the individual and secondly, oftentimes, names were prophetic in nature. With regard to the character of our study, we find in 1741 B.C., a couple brings forth a child, a son, into the world. And they name this child 
Hezekiah. And that name literally means the following, strengthened by Yahweh. It's interesting because he was the son of a king, and he eventually is going to become a king as well. In fact, he assumes the throne of Judah at the age of 25 years old, and he's going to rule in Judah for 29 long years. If we were to classify his reign, it would be classified as a reign of righteousness. He was a good king in Judah. We turn to 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, and verses 5 through 8, we learn about all the reforms that Hezekiah made in the nation of Judah. And they were numerous, but there are three statements made that I want to point out very briefly. Point number one, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, 2 Kings 18, 3. Look at verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, 2 Kings 18, 5. And then lastly, 2 Kings 18, 6, he cleaved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments. Here is a righteous man. Here is a man who looked to God, did that which was right in the sight of God, wanted to obey the commandments of the Almighty God. Notice the result of his obedience to God. It's found in verse 7 of 2 Kings 18. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went. This is the king that made a prayer in 2 Kings, the 20th chapter. So turn there, and let's briefly look at this prayer. And it's going to revolve around five words that I have chosen for the outline. The first word is this, the need. And it's found in 2 Kings, chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live the need. There are several points that we could talk about from this one verse. Number one, the sickness. Notice the text says, and in those days Hezekiah was sick. What was wrong with him? I don't have a clue. The Bible doesn't give us the exact nature of the illness. But when you look at verse 7 of the text, we do find that it was associated with a boil that had come upon him. Notice secondly, it was serious. Folks, Hezekiah was sick unto death. I don't know about you. If I'm sick and a doctor walks in and says, Vic, you're sick unto death, that's serious. I'm about to die. That is serious business. Now, notice next that a seer is involved in his sickness, is he not? A man by the name of Isaiah, yes, the writer of the book of Isaiah that we have in our Bibles, the son of Amos, comes to him. And don't you know that Hezekiah was probably relieved? Here's a prophet of God coming to me. He can see the future. He knows exactly what's going to transpire. And surely he's come to me going to tell me some good news about this sickness. But it was anything but, wasn't it? Notice the sanction. Set thine house in order. Folks, when it's the last few days of your life, there's some preparation that needs to be made, isn't there? There's some things you need to do. There's some unfinished business that needs to be completed. There's some assignments that need to be made. There are some words that need to be spoken when it's the end of life. Set thine house in order and notice the sentence of the prophet. Thou shalt die and not live. Folks, oftentimes it is need that drives men to pray, isn't it? Need. When everything's going well, when our life is affluent, when we're being blessed abundantly, oftentimes we take all of those things for granted and we do not bow the knee in prayer to God. But when you and I find out that we are weak, that we are frail, and that we are not in control, what do we do? We go to the one who is strong, who is stable, and in control of all things. So this need that Hezekiah has drives him to prayer. And that's what we find in the next section, verses 2 and 3. Plead. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now, I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. 
and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. There's four points that I want to make from this passage. Number one, the solitude. Remember Sidney made mention of the fact that Jesus often prayed alone and exhorted it to us to go into our closets and pray alone. Here Hezekiah was. He'd been told by Isaiah that he's going to die. And what does he do? He turns to the wall and pray. Just him and God. That's all. He prayed in solitude. Point two, there's the supplication. Notice the solicitation first. I beseech thee, O Lord. Folks, this is a dire matter, isn't it? This is not something to play around with. This is not something that is flippant. This is not something that deserves his lack, att lack of attention. Oh no, it is something that is dire. And he cries out unto God, I beg with you, I plead with you. Notice he talks about himself as a servant. I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. What is that, folks? Consecration, isn't it? Here's a man who had lived a consecrated life before God. He had cleansed the nation of Israel of its idolatry. He had followed the commands of the Almighty God. And now when he goes before God in prayer, he can bring that to the Father's attention, can he? It's not like the Father didn't know it. But he wants everyone to understand that I have lived a good, righteous, godly life. And upon that, I have a right to appeal unto God. Notice also his service. And have done that which is good in thy sight. Folks, if you think that your godly and righteous living and the service that you give to God means nothing, you are wrong. It forms a basis for your prayer under the Almighty God, doesn't it? Notice thirdly, the sorrow. He wept what? He wept sore. Over and over, we've been told today that we need to pray fervently. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Folks, today we don't need just a few little light-spoken words under the throne of God. No, we need individuals bowing their head and with prayer and with earnestness and with tears crying out unto the Father in heaven. The fourth point that I would make is this. There are conditions to acceptable prayer, aren't there? Number one, address to God. Number two, it's got to involve a righteous life. And number three, there must be fervency. So here's a man in need. What does he do? He's cried out unto the Father which is in heaven. The fourth word, speed. Verses five, 4 through 5a. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah the captain of my people. Wow. When Isaiah was in the home of Hezekiah, he was in the inner court, folks. He had just exited, had he not? And as he exited, he went out the door into the middle court, and that is why Hezekiah is praying. And folks, almost as fast as Hezekiah's words get out of his mouth, God what? Answers the prayer, doesn't he? Isaiah hasn't even gotten out of the temple area. I mean, out of the palace area. He's in the middle court. And what does God say? Isaiah, I've got something else for you to do. Turn around. Go back. Folks, God can answer our prayers if he wants to as quickly as we can pray them. Now, he doesn't always do that, does he? In fact, most of the time, he does not do that. But he can. And he did on this particular occasion. That leads us to the fourth point. We've seen three, the need. We've seen Hezekiah plead. We've seen the speed at which God answers. Notice that now we read of the relief. In 5b through 6, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, the, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go 
go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my, my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Two points. A man like you and me swayed an almighty God. That's amazing, isn't it? Adam made mention of the fact that he's insignificant on earth. And we are, folks. We're just little dots on this planet. We're just little dashes between the dates after our death, aren't we? We're just nothing. And yet a little nothing can bow our head before the throne of God and sway the Almighty. What did God say? I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. You have had an impact on me. And what did that do? It led to security, did it not? I will heal thee. Thou will go up unto the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to thy life. I will deliver thee from the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. All based upon one man's prayer. Prayer changes things, doesn't it? There were at least three huge things changed on that day. Number one, the mind of God. Number two, the condition of a man healed of his illness and made clean. And number three, the circumstances of his life were totally different. Sometimes you and I get a little bit discouraged maybe when it comes to prayer, don't we? We really begin to wonder, does prayer really change things? Is it really worth the effort? Do I really need to be engaged in it? Folks, the reason we had this entire section about these men who pray is because of what Sidney said at the very beginning. In every one of these individuals' lives, prayer brought results. And when you and I get down, when you and I get discouraged, when you and I think prayer does absolutely nothing, we need to remember Jesus and Elijah and Moses and Hezekiah. Prayer changes things. Three minutes left. <laughs> Miracles have not ceased. <laughs> Thank you guys. You did a great job. We appreciate it very, very much. Two or three things, and then we'll get down to uh, lunch. Uh, there are tapes being made of all of these sessions, and if you'd be interested in those, there is a sheet, very little sheet down here at the front, and you can sign that sheet, put your address on there, and we'll make certain that those...